Well, first of all, I couldn't believe that Ziggy chose me to, to take the fifth penalty kick, and uh, I didn't take a penalty kick in the semifinal, and I had my jersey off, and I had my sweatsuit on, and I was ready to cheer on other guys, and when he called my name, I knew that he had confidence in me, and that's why he chose me as a fifth penalty kick taker, and so uh, him choosing me made me feel like if, if my number was going to come up as a fifth penalty kick taker, penalty kick taker that I would find a way to score and so I was nervous. Uh, I remember there was a chance that if Brad saved the fourth penalty kick that I wouldn't have taken a penalty kick um, and when Brad uh, when Brad almost saved it but they scored in their fourth penalty it gave me an opportunity to step up and, uh, and take the last penalty kick and so um, I was uh, nervous but uh, I knew that uh, I was chosen for a reason to, to take the penalty kick and when I did I wasn't going to let my teammates down. I wasn't going to miss and uh, found a way to score. I told him not to worry about it. It never comes down to the fifth guy. <laughs> so that was the number one thing. Is me, the most important shooters are number one and three. I always try and put my best penalty takers at one and at three. And then you go with two and four. And uh, I'm different. Uh, not that Jorge was the weakest of our penalty takers, but the guy who's maybe most uncertain or, you know, you're maybe a little unsure, he ends up being number five. And we weren't sure who our fifth guy was going to be. Jorge sort of like, I said, hey, I think you can do this. It's like, well, coach, I'm not. I said, don't worry. He's just step up. It'll probably be over by the time it gets to you, is exactly what I said to him. And obviously it wasn't. And, uh, you know, he took his penalty very well. I know there was one moment where, where we, we had a very good opportunity, a really good passing sequence, and Billy Thompson missed uh, as close to an open net as you can get, missed a pretty good opportunity and pushed it wide. And when he pushed it wide, I had like seven guys on my team just fall to the ground. And I just remember screaming like mad, trying to get them to stand up because my biggest fear was Rutgers was going to put this thing down for a goal kick, play the ball forward really quick. And I got seven guys that are on the ground, you know, almost weeping because they thought the game was over with that opportunity. So uh, that always stands out in my mind from the game. Uh, obviously, Alexi's uh, header that hit the post, but more so than that, the opportunity that Paul Ratcliffe had off the corner kick where Paul... It would have probably been one of the best goals in the history of an NC2A final if it would have gone in uh, where a corner kick gets played and he back heels it as he's coming across behind his standing leg and gets all of it and Bill Andraki somehow goes to his right and gets a hand on it. So those are always three plays from that game that I'll really remember. I think that when I look back at the match, it went back and forth. It wasn't a situation where UCLA was dominating or Rutgers was dominating. We both had our chances. Um, I can remember Bill Andraki coming up huge, one of the finest saves I've ever seen, basically off the, the, his thumb nail. Uh, just an incredible reaction save that any goalkeeper coach would look and just start clapping at. Um, I think I hit the crossbar with, with my head at, at one point. Um, so it was, it was back and forth. It wasn't a situation where either team was, was outmatched. And mostly what I think about is the talent that was on the field at that time. And when you go through it, um, it was pretty incredible. And, uh, uh, you know, it didn't work out for Rutgers in the end. Um, but I think ultimately when you have a championship game, you want two of the best teams in the country. And I think without a doubt, Rutgers and UCLA that year were two of the best teams in the country.